Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. Today, we are joined by special guest Michael E. Gerber, the world's number one small business guru, according to Inc. Magazine. Michael is a transformative figure in the world of entrepreneurship. As the author of The E-Myth Revisited, a New York Times bestseller for over two decades, Michael has revolutionized how people like me think about small businesses. Also known for his work leading The Dreaming Room, a unique business startup incubator, his insights drawn from the extensive interactions with entrepreneurs and clients are encapsulated in his work Awakening the, the Entrepreneur Within. Michael's philosophy centers on businesses creating deep and meaningful impact. With a belief in the transformative power of entrepreneurship, Michael continues to inspire through his writing and the innovative online Dreaming Room project. Michael is dedicated to changing the world one small business at a time, encouraging entrepreneurs to pursue a vision greater than just profit. I've asked Michael to join us here today to share his story, talk about what's worked best in his 50 year career and what he values most looking forward. So Michael, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? My delight, Daryl. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's an honor and a pleasure. So I've Emith really changed the way I looked at business long, long time ago when I first read it. I continue to recommend it for today. This has been an interview that's been on my list for a long time. So I'm super excited to have a chance to sit down and talk with you. Before we get into things like e-myth and business, though, I'm curious, how did you even get started? Were your parents entrepreneurs? How did you get that business bug? Well, my parents weren't entrepreneurs. And in fact, I didn't even think of entrepreneurship before I got started a very close friend of mine, in fact, my brother-in-law, asked me to come with him to visit one of his clients. Mm -hmm. uh, Ace, my brother-in-law, owned a small advertising agency in Silicon Valley. And he would create leads for his clients. And his clients didn't know how to convert the leads into sales. Mm -hmm. So Ace asked if I would come visit uh, this particular client, Bob, to help him convert the leads Ace was creating into sales. I told Ace I didn't know anything about business. I was then 42 years of age. Hmm. So you understand I wasn't a kid. I wasn't you know, a young entrepreneur. Uh, I wasn't interested in entrepreneurship. When Ace came to meet me and I said, Ace, I don't know anything about business. I don't have any idea how I'm going to help Bob. Ace said to me, Michael, more than you think you do, just come with me and let's see what happens. And so I did. And I went with Ace to meet Bob. Ace introduced me to Bob. Hi, Bob, Michael. Guys, I'm going to take off, Ace said, for an hour. Then I'll come back and pick Michael up, get to know each other. Let's see what happens. Ace said goodbye. He left. Bob said to me, hi, Michael. What do you know about my business? And I said, nothing, Bob. <laughs> He said, what do you know about my product? And I said, less than that, Bob. <laughs> well, if you don't know anything about my business and you don't know anything about my product, how are you going to help me? And I said, I haven't a clue, Bob. <laughs> but Ace is gone for an hour. We've got an hour to kill. And he asked me to come here to find out how I could help you. So let's get started. And so I began to ace, ask Bob questions about his business. The remarkable thing about that experience, Daryl, was that I didn't know anything about business, I thought. They suddenly discovered Bob didn't either. <laughs> and he owned one. And so I kept on asking him questions and he kept on giving me anecdotal answers. Mm. As we did that, I came to the realization that I did know something about business. I knew that selling is a system. I learned that years before selling encyclopedias door to door. And I answered an ad and went to meet the guy who wrote the ad. And he told me a story about encyclopedias. And I said, I don't have any experience selling anything, let alone encyclopedias. He said, don't worry, that's best. You don't need any experience because I'm going to give you a script to memorize. Mm. And he said, I'm going to give you the first 15 minutes of that script. Go home, memorize the first 15 minutes and come back and say it to me. 
So that was an odd thing. I went home. I memorized the first 15 minutes. And the reason I could memorize the first 15 minutes was because I'd been studying saxophone for years. Hey. And I memorized music. So I memorized the script. I went back and said what I'd memorized. And he said, wonderful, Michael. But here, do it this way. And then he repeated the script, but differently than I'd said it. Then I did what he did. And then he said, great, now go back and memorize this. And he gave me the last half of the script. Well, the long and the short of it is I memorized the script. I memorized the process. And he dropped me off on the street with several other guys to knock on doors. Hi, you don't know me. I'm Michael E. Gerber with Encyclopedia Americana. Please don't worry about it. I'm not here to sell encyclopedia. I'm here to tell you a story that's amazing when you hear it. Can I come in and tell you the story? And they wouldn't. Anyway, long and the short of it is, what I came to realize is that Bob didn't have a selling system. Hmm. Not only that, Bob didn't even know what a selling system was. When I realized that, it became obvious to me that's what Bob needed. Bob said, what's a selling system? So I told him something like I've just told you, Daryl. Right. So Bob said to me, why do I need that? I said, because you've got guys you've hired to sell your product. Right. And you hired them because, one, they're IT guys, and two, they're sales guys. So the presumption is they know about technology, they know about sales, so hell, they should be able to sell your technology. So each and every one of them did whatever the hell they did. Jerry did it his way, Judy did it her way, Jim did it his way. You got my point. Yep, 100%. There was no way to do it. Yep. And that's what I said to Bob. So I said, Bob, you need a way to do it. Your way, not their way. And he said, can you do that for me? Can you create? <laughs> I said, sure, Bob. So Bob hired me as his consultant to create his selling system. Hmm. He comes back to pick me up. He said, what happened? I said, Bob hired me as his consultant. And he says to me, what are you talking about? You don't know anything about business. You don't know anything about Bob's business. How can you become a consultant for Bob? I said, Ace, that's what I told you before we came here. <laughs> yeah. That's what but I discovered I did know something. And then I shared the story I just shared with you with Ace. Mm -hmm. Long and the short of it is, I did create this script for Bob's salespeople. Mm -hmm. And sales went up. And then I did it for Mary. And then I did it for Judy. And then I did it for Jim. And then I did it for Jack. You understand? Then I suddenly realized Ace didn't have a selling system for his clients. Mm -hmm. He created leads but he wasn't concerned about what they did with the leads afterward. That wasn't his job. His job was to create leads. Their job was to sell them. Right. And the first company, the second company, the third company, the fourth company. But as I did that, I began to realize Bob didn't have a management system either. And Bob didn't have a marketing system either. Mm -hmm. And Bob didn't have a... you financial system either. In short, Bob didn't have systems for doing anything. Right. Bob hired people who knew how to do stuff. Bob created a people-dependent company, not a systems-dependent company. And so I realized there was an opportunity in Bob's company. But the more I realized that was true of every one of Ace's clients. Mm -hmm. Therein, I invented the e-myth. And therein, I created a company to teach small business owners how to create the systems they needed in order to turn their business into a little money machine, a company that worked instead of a company that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And therein was my future. Right. And that's my story. I, I mean, I love it. I love it. I love it. And so how, I've got a bunch of questions I want to follow up with. First off, it sounds like everything evolved organically. 
your your first business experience was selling encyclopedias. What was your career in life before 42, before meeting Ace? You mentioned- I was something. a saxophone player. Yeah. I was a carpenter. I learned how to frame houses. I learned how to do this. I learned how to do that. I did all different kinds of things. I was a wandering Jew. That's what I was. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it was a charm life for sure. Cause it, it gave, laid the foundation yeah. for something wonderful. And so can you talk through your system for developing these systems? Obviously, as you said, when you first talked to Ace, you didn't feel you knew a lot about business, but then you realized that you did because one of the things that you had learned is you had learned a sales system. So you could see what he was lacking and that on the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. So that allowed you to lead Bob per se. But as you ventured into these other avenues, you've got the seven centers, right? So Stan, in my earlier life, when I say I was a musician, I, I learned how to practice the saxophone. I had learned how to um, frame a house. Um, I learned how to learn. Uh, something very few people learn how to do, Daryl. Mm -hmm. I learned how to learn. So when I saw something that I needed to get done, I knew I had to learn how to do that. So I knew how to learn something. And I was faced with all of the things I needed to learn how to do, knowing that's what our clients needed to learn how to do. So in order for them to learn how to do that, I had to create a school for them to do that. And that was the beginning of our coaching business. Mm -hmm. um, we created um, Michael Thomas Corporation. I was Michael. The guy Ace brought in to replace me when I decided to leave Ace's advertising agency was named Tom Travisano. Mm -hmm. Tom came in to replace me in Ace's company. And as I was teaching Tom what I did with Ace's clients, Tom became interested, where are you going, Michael? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to create my own company to do this. And Ace began, Tom began to become very fascinated by my idea that I was going to create a company to do this. So Tom said, I want to go with you. <laughs> and he did. And when Tom came with me, and this was in 1977, he came with me to create a company. And that company was the Michael Thomas Corporation. I was Michael, he was Thomas. Michael Thomas Corporation was the first business development firm of its kind. Teach small business owners how to turnkey their businesses, just like Ray Kroc did at McDonald's. Hmm. My mind said, was McDonald's. And my mindset was McDonald's because McDonald's was a turnkey small business. Mm -hmm. McDonald's had become the most successful small business on the planet. And it became the most successful small business on the planet because it was turnkeyed to be scaled explicitly in a very specific way. Right do what it had to do in order to deliver what it promised to deliver to the millions upon millions of people who walked in their door. Right. And I love that. The mentality too. McDonald's is not, I say that sometimes in the sense of that perspective, that it's there to serve the community. It's exactly what you said in the sense that they're never like, oh, Sally's sick, the drive throughs closed. McDonald's has a system to have a pool of talent on call to serve the community. A business all a business is, is a group of people that solve the problem of another group of people and they do it via a product or service. And so that's really what you're describing is how to provide that. I saw this unfortunate fellow the other day on uh, Twitter, some sort of teacher telling kids about how uh, capitalism is your boss pays you 20 bucks an hour. And the only way the system works is that 20 hours, you make more than $20 worth of value per hour. And really you should just go out on your own and make your own money. His, his, his idea was that he, the worker was being ripped off by the business owner. And the flawed thinking in that is that this gentleman who's, you know, well, I'm not going to insult him, but this gentleman, unfortunately, spent his whole life not learning the lesson that business is a team sport. 
And then although you're getting $20 an hour, that doesn't include the R&D money to, to stay competitive, to constantly you know, pursue excellence at solving that problem, to find the clients that need the, the problem solved, right? To train up the staff, to invest in assets, the planning and projections for facilitating this and serving, serving a community to solve a problem. It's so much more than just having one guy that you make him do the work and you keep half the money. That's just such a simplistic view of what it means to run a business. My sense is businesses solve problems. My teeth hurt. I'm hungry. I'm bored. Businesses solve problems. And to solve those problems, like you mentioned, for large sums of people requires a team effort. And you can't, and it's just, it, it's really, I'm going to get off my soapbox now, but. You understand, Daryl, that McDonald's didn't hire people who knew how to do that. Right. They, yeah, they built it. McDonald's, built it. McDonald's didn't hire people who knew that knew how to do that. McDonald's didn't hire people with experience. Yep. McDonald's hired people who didn't know anything. Yep. They came to McDonald's and learned how to do it McDonald's way. Yep. Exactly like this. Right. In short, right. McDonald's created a turnkey business operating system, yep. a yep. successful yep. system that worked to deliver the brand called McDonald's. Yep. And it was that brand called McDonald's that people were buying. Yep. People weren't buying Mary or Joe or Jimmy or Jack. People were buying McDonald's. Right. And that is the critical key between what Ray Kroc did at McDonald's. Ray Kroc went to work on their first store, perfect the operation of that store before he ever created store number two. Mm. Ray Kroc built the franchise prototype mm. for McDonald's mm. so that he could replicate that prototype explicitly, exactly the same way, visually, emotionally, functionally, financially. He hired kids who learned the system to deliver the system faithfully in such a way that he could replicate that brand faithfully in store number two, number 10, number 20, number 47,000 mm -hmm. around the world. Astonishing, absolutely astonishing. And that's what we taught our small business owners how to do. So can you speak something I'd love to hear you? Can you speak to the rule of 10,000? I read it in one of your auxiliary, auxiliary and I think I'm making, making a word up. One of your other books was something that really stuck with me, The rule, and it still sticks with me to today. It's the rule of 10,000. Yes, the rule of 10,000 essentially says what I say in my last e-myth book called Beyond the E-Myth, the evolution of an enterprise from a company of one to a company of 1,000. Hmm. understand that's the rule of 10,000 and effectively you can create the 10,000th company by creating the first one right hmm. what 99% of all small business owners don't understand is that rule that you're creating a turnkey methodology you're not going out to find the best people you're going in to create the most extraordinary system. The colors that you use, the shape of the, the store, the golden arches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you see that once, you can see that a thousand times. And that's critical. And it's missing, Daryl. It's the most important thing to understand. Most small business owners fail. Most fail in their first year when they go out on the job because they create a job for themselves. They don't create a system. And that is the rule of 10,000. I love that. So what would you recommend to someone who's either starting out or struggling? They, they probably drink the Kool-Aid. They're like, okay, I get it. I need to make the systems, but I don't know how to build a selling system, Michael. I don't know how to do it. What would you recommend? Absolute, and absolutely, they don't know. And that's why we bring them into what we call the eightfold path. And the eightfold path is exactly that. It's a process that we walk every single small business owner through. The first step in the process is I have a dream. 
The second step in the process is I have a vision. The third step in the process is I have a purpose. The fourth step in the process is I have a mission. Dream, vision, purpose, mission. That's the platform upon which a great growing business is created. Those are the first four steps. The next four steps are the job, the practice, the business, the enterprise. The job is the client fulfillment system. The practice is the lead generation, lead conversion, client fulfillment system. What I call the three-legged stool. The three-legged stool is the franchise prototype. And what effectively I'm saying to every small business owner is that every small company a franchise, every small company a franchise. And if every small company is a franchise, that means you need to create a franchise system. And the franchise system is your franchise prototype. And it's the three-legged stool I just described, how you generate leads, how you convert those leads into customers and client fulfillment, how you convert those customers into clients. Lead generation, lead conversion, client fulfillment. That's your franchise prototype. Mm -hmm. You go to work on your franchise prototype. You go to work on the practice to design, build, launch, and grow your franchise prototype. The next step is the business. And the business is nothing other than up to seven turnkey practices. Get that. A business is nothing other than up to seven turnkey practices. What's a practice? Lead generation, lead conversion, client fulfillment. That's one. Lead generation, lead conversion, client fulfillment. That's two. Lead generation, lead conversion, client fulfillment. That's three. In short, a practice is your prototype plus a turnkey management system. So the business I'm saying to every new small would-be business owner is up to seven turnkey practices with a turnkey management system. So I go to work on the business to replicate the practice. You get my point? I think so. I'm, I'm visually, emotionally, functionally, financially. Visually, emotionally, functionally, financially. A turnkey practice. This is how you do it. 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 Now you do it. Now you do it. And we create seven of those. Store number one, store number two, store number three, store number four, etc. And that's the business. Now I'm going to replicate the business to become an enterprise. What's an enterprise? It's up to seven turnkey businesses plus a turnkey leadership system mm. seven turnkey businesses is what it's 49 turnkey practices so if the first seven is my district okay next 49 is our enterprise okay now, I'm designing, building, launching, and growing a great growing company. That's how you do it. So let me clear, because you said the eightfold path. So the first, the dream, the vision, the purpose, the mission. And then after that is the job and the practice. The job is the client fulfillment. The practice is lead gen, lead conversion. Lead gen, lead conversion, client fulfillment. Ah, okay. So the job is client fulfillment. Got it. The practice is the three-legged stool together as a whole. And doing that seven times, you have a business. So that's, is that seven locations or is that creating seven different like lead gen? Because they say diversity leads to stability. So you're talking same about- Same lead generation system. It's the same <laughs> lead system. It's the same client fulfillment system. It's documented right. rigorously, explicitly, and identically the same way as the first practice. I'm now just replicating the practice seven times. Store number one, store number two, store number three, uh, store number four, okay. number five, number six, number seven, Got it. plus a turnkey management system. Mm -hmm. Got it.
Got so it. now I'm going to manage the seven different companies. Store number one, store number two, service number one, service number two. You got it. Mm -hmm. Seven times. To get it right. Yep. To get it right. I'm going to work on my business to get it right. Like now, that. once I've gotten it right in my business, now I'm going to replicate my business to create an enterprise. So now I'm going to replicate my business seven times, right. which is seven times seven. Right. 49 practices, seven businesses, which is now my enterprise. Right. With the turnkey management system, with the turnkey leadership system, you get it. Yes, I do get it. And That's how Ray Kroc created McDonald's. And what are the biggest mistakes people making with this process? They keep on forgetting. What does that mean? They keep on forgetting to do what I just said. <laughs> they get distracted? Shiny objects? They get distracted by everything. They, they forget, oh my God, I forgot. It's got to be a script. It's got to be a script. He's got to do it just like she's got to do it, just like he's got to do it, just like she's got to do it. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same. Every single time, it's the same. That's our brand. That's what they forget. Are there any other big mistakes that they make? So and they forget to manage it. Forget to keep score. And they forget to count the money. That was something that was... And they forget, and they forget to go to the bank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Forget to do it the way I just described it. Right. They don't have the discipline they need to do it the way I just described it. And doing it the way I just described it is key. Mm. Do anything other than the way I just described it is a disaster waiting to happen. Mm. And that's, and that's why with, everybody fails. And that's coming with 50 years of experience. This isn't like you put up a shingle yesterday and this is your idea. And I actually have research, scientific research to back it up. In 2020, I knew when everybody was leaving their jobs, heard about the pandemic, that the sharks would be in the water. Um, I I had done a couple of workshops in Vietnam with a friend. He was a copywriter for Mind Valley, a, a $100 million company out of Malaysia. And we did a couple of workshops together just for fun. And he couldn't make the third one that we did in Saigon. And I did it on my own. And this gentleman came and this was just a side hobby thing. It was, we would record them and maybe we would make a product out of it and sell it. And the, the, the guarantee was if at the lunch break, you're not satisfied, let me know. I'll give you a full refund, all that stuff. And I, I think I had something like 25 people in a room and, and one gentleman did, he came and asked for a refund. He was an older gentleman. He said, this sounds great, but it was about online marketing. And he's, I'm not good with computers. This is great, but I just, I'm really not good with computers. I thought this could be like an evening weekend thing. And I gave him a refund, Finish the conference. My wife now, she she's Filipino and her first year in business, she grew a six figure business and she did it while she was pregnant and then breastfeeding and tending to a child. And she did it building a writing agency. And this gentleman, this young guy that was there in this workshop I did, he stayed to the end. He ate all my food at lunch, stayed to the end. And at the end, he picked my girl, my, at my time, she was my girlfriend. Now she's my wife but picked her brain because he was so shocked. He was trying to get out of teaching English and he couldn't make enough as an independent freelance writer to pay his bills. And he was picking her brain. He's like, how are you doing this? And while we're cleaning up from the event, my daughter's there, a little three-year-old running around. And then finally we go to go. And at the end, he's, oh, by the way, I need to get that refund for you. I, I gave you my rent money to come to this. And if I don't get that back, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. And I was like, bro, and I, whatever, I gave him his money back. But I'm, I'm getting to a point here. Two, three months later, this guy is posting in the local Facebook groups about his uh, manifest the business of your dreams workshop he's putting on. And I was so livid that this guy was doing that. And I was so mad. I, I got a bunch of friends together and I decided I was going to try to find a way to audit business gurus. I put a preprint together called the fake guru solution. And what I was going to do is go through all the academic literature to identify what hundred years of scientific research has proven were critical success factors in business. We find a way to measure those and improvements in those areas. 
And then we would put gurus through the paces to third party validate them. So if someone said they can improve your business, there was some foundation of truth. And what I learned was a lot of business gurus did not want to be publicly put on fire like that. But what I also found is I discovered eight critical success factors for small and medium sized businesses. And they are self efficacy, market intelligence. Sorry, self efficacy, market intelligence, strategic planning, marketing strategy, sales strategy, and skills, money management, business operations, and business intelligence. So those are the eight that we came up with, but everything stands on the self efficacy one. And so I said all that to tell you that you're 100% right that what we learned in our research, and those are just the names that I gave them, right? You have to make it practical for people, which you really do very well. But it all stands on that self efficacy. And self-efficacy for us in our research is, is demonstrating certain personality traits, certain leadership skills, and certain personal disciplines. Discipline is literally one of the categories. Some of the personality traits, I'll pull it up here, but some of the personality traits are locus of control, which is being a control freak about what you can control, extroversion, openness to experience, agreeableness, conscientiousness, acceptance of criticism and feedback. These are personality traits that we found positively forward. And this is after looking at hundreds and literally thousands of studies. And then leadership, what is leadership? We found in our research, we put leadership as self-awareness skills, communication, cooperation skills, emotional intelligence, and adaptability. The vision, all this other stuff, that comes from the strategic planning, the market intelligence, that sort of stuff, right? And then of course you have the disciplines, the physical health, the mental health, time management, a commitment to improve, a sense of urgency. These are some of, they call them soft skills. They're more like the vital skills, because like you said, that you, you put everything on a platter for people and it falls apart because they don't have the discipline. They don't have a sense of urgency. They don't have that. I want to ask over your years, what are some of the habits that you feel are most important? Obviously to go through your eight step or the eight fold path, it's not a one, it's not a one week thing. It's an ongoing process do anything long enough, a pattern emerges. Patterns can be described as habits. What habits do you feel are critically important? I can give you those habits, but the problem is you're not going to teach them. Hmm. Um, you're not in the business of teaching those habits, right. and you're not going to be successful teaching those habits. Effectively, what you'll be successful at, if you're going to be successful at anything, is teaching the script that people need to memorize. And I say this and I repeat this and I say this again, everything is a script. Everything is a script. Mm -hmm. What you say is the most critical differentiation to create the brand at the heart of who you are. Five essential skills are concentration, discrimination, organization, innovation and communication. Concentration, discrimination, organization, innovation and communication. To teach those is immensely difficult. Hmm. We're not in the business of teaching those, we're in the business of describing those, but not teaching those. Hmm. Calling their attention to those, but not teaching those. What we teach is this is what you say, this is how you say it, this is why you say it, and this is what you get done. People want the fish. So we got to do that. Yep. We got to do that. And we got to do that because that's what works. And it's the most difficult thing to get people to do. Do you understand? It's the most difficult thing to get people to do. Mm -hmm. Just as learning the saxophone, what did I have to do? I had to practice. I had to practice. My saxophone teacher said, you don't make music, Michael. Music finds you when you practice. The great saxophone players on the planet practice constantly until it happens. You don't make it happen. It happens because you practice. So it's the rigor of your practice that enables you to produce that result. I love it. I love it. I love it. So where, first off, and a lot of respect for saxophone, that is not an easy instrument. I played clarinet. I was put in a school music program at my school and for five years, and clarinets and saxophones were side by side. And the lung power it takes. Anytime I saw, my daughter goes to a private school here, 
and there was a live band came and this guy put on a solo that I got out of my chair and I applauded because I knew how just, I don't know if everyone respected that, but that the talent, it's, it's, I'm not just trying to, you know, anybody that knows, if you don't know, you don't know. It's And the, and the truth is they don't do it. So right. the fact of the matter is some will, some won't. The ones who will get better, the ones who won't fail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it comes down to something that basic and that elemental. You either will or you won't. You either will or you won't. You either will or you won't. It's that fundamental. So if it's that fundamental, then it, success is that fundamental. And that's true of athletics. That's true of music. That's true of writing. That's true of singing. That's true of anything. You either will or you won't. You either will or you won't. So you say that to a small business owner, you either will or you won't. Will what I'm going to teach you. Yeah. It's on the page. It's on the page. Look on the page. It's B flat. It's C sharp. Look on the page. Look on the page. Now memorize it. Yeah. Come back. Come back. After you've memorized it. Right. My encyclopedia manager said, come back after you've memorized it. My framing instructor said, come back after you've memorized it. Memorized what? This, like this, like this, like this. No, not like that. Not like that. Like this, like this, like this. That's as basic and elemental as anything is. Mm. And that's what a business owner has to learn. Like this. Now you do it. Now you do it. Now you do it. Now do it to the point where it's doing it. And that's the skill everyone needs to learn who's going to learn anything they're going to learn anything mm -hmm. and when i say discipline the discipline to follow that path where do you see the future going with all these new developments things like ai and i don't know bitcoin we're in a precarious time there's a lot happening i don't see, I don't see the future going anywhere okay. so it, so it's like the future will go where it's going okay. i can't predict the future can only predict the present. Okay. And to the degree, and to the degree I operate in the present, in the way I create the present, the future will find itself, and it will reveal itself in the process of mastering the present. Mm. The future will reveal itself in the process of mastering the present. You ain't going anywhere until you master the present. I love that. I love that. Can I actually read a short? You reminded me of one of my favorite poems. It's Arnold Bennett on how to live on 24 hours a day. And it goes, it's about 20, 30 seconds, maybe. And it goes, time is the inexplicable raw material of everything. With it, all is possible. Without it, nothing. The supply of time is truly a daily miracle, an affair genuinely astonishing when one examines it. You wake up in the morning and lo, your purse is magically filled with 24 hours of the unmanufactured tissue of the universe of your life. It is yours. It is the most precious of possessions. No one can take it from you. It is unstealable. And no one receives either more or less than you receive. In the realm of time, there no, is no aristocracy of wealth and no aristocracy of intellect. Genius is never rewarded by even an extra hour a day. And there is no punishment. Waste your infinitely precious commodity as much as you will, and the supply will never be withheld from you. Moreover, you cannot draw on the future. It is impossible to get into debt. You can only waste the passing moment. You cannot waste tomorrow. It is kept for you. You cannot waste the next hour. It is kept for you. I have said the affair was a miracle, is it not? You have to live on this 24 hours of daily time. Out of it, you have to spend health, pleasure, money, content, respect, and the evolution of your immortal soul. Its right use, its most effective use, is a matter of the highest urgency and of the most thrilling actuality. All depends on that. Your happiness, the elusive prize that you are all clutching for, my friends, depends on that. If one cannot arrange that an income of 24 hours a day shall exactly cover all proper items of expenditure, one does muddle one's whole life indefinitely. We shall never have any more time. We have, and we have always had, all the time there is. By Arnold Bennett, How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. I love that. That's on my daily reads. Talk about process. And there you go. And all that time, all he said was what I just said. Yeah. Master, <laughs> master the present. 
and the future will find you. Yeah, yeah. Kill the mess of the present, and there is no future but stupid. So let's talk about what's worked best through the. I gotta go. I've gotta go. Okay. So before we hop off, then, is there anything I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? Is that? Is there anything I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? What's that? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Do you feel? <laughs> what you didn't ask me is what am I going to do tomorrow? What are you going to do tomorrow? A, a dreaming room. Mm. So every single solitary soul who's listened to us, if they got what I said to become a master of today, have to join us in the dreaming room. And if they do join us in the dreaming room to discover their dream, their vision, their purpose, and their mission, they will create it tomorrow unlike anything they could possibly imagine. And if they don't, they're lost. Mm. So that's what I would invite every single person listening to us to do. To Michael at michaelegerber.com and say, Michael, I want to join you in a dreaming room. I want to join you in a dreaming room. I'll repeat that one more time, Daryl. I want to join you in a dreaming room. Put that up for them. Put my name up for them. Yeah, we'll do. For those that and are- Have them come join us. That's Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-E, -E Gerber, G-E-R-B-E-R.com. And go join the dreaming room. You can also find him on LinkedIn, everywhere else. If you just look up E-Myth, of course, it'll all lead back to Michael. Go look up Michael E. Gerber, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-E-G-E-R-B-E-R. -E -E Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for coming and sharing with my audience and I, knowing you have your own audience, your own family, your own clients. Oh, a delight. And Daryl, enroll 20 people in the dreaming room. And you'll be able to go through that dreaming room and learn how to lead a dreaming room. Mm. Become one of my dreaming room leaders. All right. Okay. That, do that. And I'll describe how to do that in a separate um, conversation. Sounds like a plan. Something right. magical will happen in the Philippines. Sounds like a plan. Thank you so you much. You got it. All right. Take care.